he said, I've been it, that's a weapon we a working man at time for and betray your country, serve your class. Don't sign up for war, my friend, don't sign up for war. When he turned them with the alongside Hall John stood up at the fountain. But what he said was male and made to magnify the friction. Ye patriots can roar and ball, it's not the drag, it's friction. The only war with fighting war is the one against the pressure. Yeah, as we saw this centenary coming up, we certainly wanted to produce a, a design about this uh, fabled incident. And I looked on, uh, online, which I often do before I deserve, design a shirt, to see what other people have been doing. There are plenty of other events around this truce, actually, many of them, official events, often using uh, two handshaking soldiers with a football in front of them, very literal, if you like. It's okay, perfectly okay. We wanted to show it somehow differently. So I picked the British sector of the Western Front at that time running south from Ypres down to La Basse. And I showed it as a twisting centre line marked in barbed wire of a football pitch, you know, a, a symbolic football pitch, with uh, England playing from the left, Germany from the right. So the whole thing, and a dotted line of villages, well-known villages on our sector. This is about 30 miles from top to bottom between Ypres and La Basse. These villages were anglicised by our own troops into White Sheet, Plug Street you know, we, wipers. None of them could use the, say the proper French or Belgian names, so everything became anglicised. But they are resonant names. If you've read anything about this campaign, those names all mean something. From Ypres down to La Bassa. And yeah, I wanted it on a, on a colour of the military dress that our troops were wearing. And as few colours as possible, keep the thing very simple. It's a symbol, rather than an illustration. Yeah, just briefly. Uh, there was a momentary pause in the conflict. The following year, there were, there were offensives specially timed to make sure this didn't happen again. But for this one time, they were really taken by surprise. And football seemed to be the natural thing they found themselves doing, having met their opposite numbers and had a chat. The next thing I did was start having a kickabout. So we're all in favour of that. I think it's a recognition of that, that, you know, beyond the nonsense of the war, people managed to find a sort of moment of common humanity. And that also, I mean, this is the thing with sports, is the logic of play. And the logic of play resists the logic of accumulation and the logic of war. Um, and you really can't see a more powerful symbol of just a kind of common humanity in the middle of what was an otherwise completely insane situation. And it gives me a lot of, uh, gives me a lot of hope that human beings actually are as good as we think they can be rather than the complete disaster that we are most of the time. A tremendous act of, like David said, of courage to not just go to no man's land and play with the enemy, but play the enemy's game, you know? Um, it's tremendous. We're not good at celebrating wars, you know, we never soldiers aren't, aren't heroes to us. It's, 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 um, it's a thorny subject in Germany. It's, it's very difficult to deal with it. Uh, which, which makes it all the more pleasant to be here because it's... Um, um, how shall I say this? It's... Um, in, in a way, it's, it, it's, it's very, very English, you know, to combine such a serious subject in, in, in such a light-hearted way. I, I'm enjoying it immensely, I must say. It, it obviously gives it a resonance, and the Germans, of course, always claim that they won, and you know, nothing changes. But the point is, you know, we've got a very simple message. It's not about football remembering, it's about football taking sides and saying football versus war. And unfortunately, the score, 1914-18, was the war cost 18 million lives. Football managed to stop the war for 90 minutes, but thank goodness it did. I think it's really important that young people today learn how football you know, um, allowed men who were in the middle of that horror of World War I to come together and remember. Maybe even just for a moment, it, it perhaps seems futile, but I think that moment of harmony and peace between them, you know, it, that is still there with us today, and I think that's the important message about the truce. I think there is a lot of romanticisation. I don't think we've really got to the bottom of what actually happened. I don't think we ever will. But it's just great to have something 
that's truly a story of action from below. So much of our history of the First World War and of great wars is about, you know, is about generals and politicians and their plans and their visions and their ways of doing things. And how amazing, if only for one moment, that the people on the ground said, actually, we're going to do it our way. It's a wonderful story, you know, it's a wonderful story for children, you know. It's a wonderful story for all generations and uh, it can inspire, you know, that, that's what it, it can inspire and inform. And what, what, what could be better than that for whatever generation, whatever age? And we promise to stand shoulder to shoulder with working people across the globe in the only wars that we should be having, the wars against poverty, the wars against injustice, the wars against inequality. In the biggest war, the last great war, comrades, we should be fighting is the war against the whole stinking capitalist system that brings misery and war to everybody across this world. Solidarity, comrades. It's a bit like a dog shouldn't just be for Christmas, a two shouldn't just be for Christmas. And although um, at the time, it, you know, it, it was a wonderful thing and lasted a few days, it doesn't take away the horrors and, and nonsense that that whole war was, you know. So it's a, a sort of an oasis and a desert, if you like, you know. It's important, but it doesn't take away from the horrors that went on. Yeah, and I came here because I was just quite interested in, um, in sort of looking at the role of football um, in like broader affairs, so just in sort of, obviously within war, but also in a broader social context as well. Football kind of is, plays a really pivotal role in, in society. And I think in terms of the role of football, it is obviously a universal language, it's something that uh, brings so many thousands and millions of people together. Um, but I think it's also really important to interrogate the role that football has kind of within dominant structures. Um, and, so, and so how it can be also then used to subvert those structures, so how it can be used to subvert sort of heteropatriarchy, capitalism and white supremacy, um, and sort of the, the huge collectives of people that are involved in the beautiful game, um, how they can be used as a form of resistance to, um, to sort of what's happening um, in society today, both on a kind of national context, but also um, in a global context. So, you know, we by no means say that football is a solution to any of these ills, but it's a hook to get people talking and to get people involved and to kind of harness the kind of power of the collective. So we're not interested, not only in in what happens on the pitch. So we are a network of people from, academic people from university um, who are involved in the history of football, sociology of football and so on, and sports journalists who care, and a fan organization who deal with um, anti-discrimination and um, yeah, lots of topics that are closely related to the Christmas truce. The importance of commemorating this is not just about the past, as uh, inspiring as that is, it's about the present and it's about the future and how we stop future wars. The soldier who survived the Somme, but who died in World War I's injury time. A few weeks from the end of that churning conflict, in no man's land, as he was leading a charge, he received life's red card. Known for his calm when the world was aflame, we need his memory at this time, when the humanity of Britain's immigrants is being so furiously denied. So sleep well, Walter Tull, and we'll do what it takes to ensure that, to your story, the world remains awake. needs you to fight, to risk your life on the front lines trying to kill somebody who's just like you, but not like you. Different people, bad people, fascists, foreigners. It's 100 years since a few brave individuals for a few fleeting moments stepped into the truth that these battles are never about the differences between us, they are about the differences between our leaders. This week, for the first time, we heard that women will be allowed to fight in our armed forces on the front line. There we go, a hundred years of progress, and we've gone from asking half our population to give up their lives at the whim of the industrial military complex 
to a world where we ask the whole population to give up their lives at the whim of the industrial military complex. I wonder if there was any time, every time when little boys didn't play like fighting games. It was like ploughman and horse. I don't know. But it was in us already, wasn't it? And football, I knew nothing about uh, in, in the juniors, nothing about. I knew about George Best. I knew that he was a superstar and that he walked like a woman and that he wore a bra. Um, but not that he played football. That was a mystery to me. I, I'd assumed he was some sort of female impersonator like Les Dawson. Or, or Barry Manilow. Oh, deliver us from evil, from our misery and pain. Unless you find a way to use them for financial gain. Well, who ever heard of helping folks who are down on their luck? Well, there's no room up the internet, you can't erase it. It's fun. Well, I thought I knew the story of Jackie Robinson, the person who broke the color line in Major League Baseball. I did not know that Jackie Robinson was a barnstorming speaker for civil rights in the 1950s, that he tirelessly traveled the South to speak in front of NAACP meetings. In fact, according to their own records at the NAACP, Jackie Robinson was the number one most requested speaker. The number two most requested speaker was someone you might have heard of, a guy named Martin Luther King. And I find that really amusing, because you imagine like people sitting around trying to organize an event, and they're like, okay, who can we get? Can we get Jackie Robinson? He's busy. All right, let's get Dr. King. Damn it, I can't believe we have to have Dr. King, Jackie Robinson. Was. But that's how popular he was. That was his role in the culture. And he would always end his talks the same way, his big line. He would say, if I had to choose tomorrow between the Baseball Hall of Fame and full citizenship for my people, I would choose full citizenship time and again. And he would always speak about, and this is something we really need to remember today, about differentiating between his success as an individual and the situation for the mass of black people in the United States. He said, don't act like we have it made because I have had some success. I'm more interested in how we're doing as a whole. And that's very important, as we spoke about earlier today, about not confusing iconography with broader progress. Not confusing the fact that a white kid has a Michael Jordan poster on the wall with there actually being racial justice. Those are two entirely different things. Oh, I mean, I think what philosophy football does is very important because sports is such a intrinsic part of our lives. And to be able to say we should take a day to remember the history of sports, the history of the political intersection uh, with sports, I think is something that has a tremendous value. And I wish there were philosophy football type organizations in every state in the United States. We'd be much better off. I mean, I knew about him just being like, ah, you know, and I'm um, saying all kinds of rhymes. I did not know the Muhammad Ali who said this. Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home? and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are denied, are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights. This is the day when such evils must come to an end. I've been warned that to take such a stand would cost me millions of dollars, but I have said it once and I will say it again. The real enemy of my people is here. I'll go to jail, so what? We've been in jail for 400 years. I mean that, and keep in mind, it's not just, it's worth applause. It's not just the sentiment, but it's who he was in saying it. It was 1914 Christmas Day, but we weren't feeling merry. We had just finished burying some of your lads when Big Tom points at this jerry. The boy was going and put of the trench. He was waving a bottle of brandy He was kicking the football as he walked And his dribbling looked quite handy He shouted, Merry Christmas, Jock! To emergency football spilling But he gives a drink, pal, Tom replied I knew just how he was feeling Then all of a sudden, weeping Scott Goes jumping out of the wire and he's waving across to the jerry boy, shouting, Trust that's hot your fire. Well, the jerry boy called out some pals, and Pim began to play them. 
in some Norfolk bed, came down the line and wandering up their tail. I think the tone's been tremendous because what they've done is to say, look, we've got this history, but we're talking to people about what it means for them today, what, what are the issues in sport today, what are the issues to do with war today, and I'm very, very pleased to be a part of it. I think it's a tremendous thing, and it's the thing that we should, uh, we should make sure that more of these events take place. And I think what they were saying is we have more that unites us than divides us. And that's a message in this terrible world of war, of attacks on immigrants, of racism. It's a, it's a message we should still remember. It's great. To, it's, you know, cosmopolitanism in its kind of purest form. Because football, you know, is played by the same rules everywhere. And yet everywhere it's fundamentally different. And that's the joy of, you know, that's the joy of humanity, isn't it? We're all one, but we've all got our own take. And there, I can't think of anything better than football to illustrate that. As Edward Galliano said, show me how you play and I'll tell you who you are. Just like I think we need big broadcast media and social media, I think we need to be able to bring people together for mass meetings so people can debate and discuss and not just exist behind their screens. All of these things, all of these forms of communication and connectivity are vital for building a lasting solidarity that can affect change. And I mean, I, I just think that what philosophy football does is so important because it brings together sports people who might not like politics and political people who might not like sports and shows the value of, of, of each camp. And that can only lead to good things. To the Emily Davidson movies and it goes like this. Agitate, organize, celebrate. That's what philosophy football is all about. So stop the clocks and open up your ears and hear our voices sing. Cause there's more than one voice here and baby, we've come to say something. We've come to say something. We've come to say something. We've come to say something.